Yeah, thank you, Sam. Uh, hopefully at this point, everyone can hear me and see my screen. Uh, so let's get started. So if at any point there's any technical issues or there's any questions you have, then feel free to directly post it into the meeting chat or the WeChat group, uh, whatever you'd like to. So that with us, that said, let's get started. So my name is Peter and today's topic is introduction to Ethereum. But before we talk about Ethereum, let's talk about what, we, what we've had before on this uh, introduction to blockchain uh, webinar series, as, as Sam mentioned. So some of you might have uh, been here for the last few uh, lessons. So first lesson, Sam was introducing the history of Bitcoin and the history of blockchain to us uh, with some fun example and all the interesting historical details. Second time, we talked about cryptography. So we learned the cryptographic building blocks used in many systems, including blockchain, like cryptography, hashing, digital signatures. And we also talked about some uh, advanced stuff like zero knowledge proofs. The third time we talked about consensus mechanisms. So consensus is when, at least in computer science, consensus is when you have a group of computers and they need an algorithm to agree on something to reach consensus. And the last time we, we dived into the topic of Bitcoin and talked about how Bitcoin actually works. You know, talked about these UTXOs, what transactions are, what blocks are. Uh, so that laid the groundwork of our understanding of blockchain. So the goal of today's lecture is to give you a, a general understanding of what Ethereum is and talk about what decentralized applications and smart contracts are. So that is the topic uh, for today. By the way, our previous lectures, most of them are, are on our YouTube channel recorded, and we can also give you access to the slides. So if you need any of those, then please let us know and, I, and we can send you the link. Okay, so today we, we will start by discussing what Ethereum is. Then we will talk about the brief history of Ethereum. We will define what decentralized applications are and see some cool examples and also talk about how they work. And then finally, we talk about something I call blockchain governance, which means that, okay, we say that this is a decentralized network, uh, not controlled by any single entity. So then who controls it? So I start by talking about Ethereum itself and let's see what they have to say about themselves. I encourage you to check out their website, ethereum.org. Uh, I just checked it, it's been updated recently and it's very cool. I think it has a lot of cool information. It has a cool animation that I wanted to embed, but it became an image, unfortunately. So on the top here, this should be moving, but whatever. So what they say about themselves is that Ethereum is a global open source platform for decentralized applications. On Ethereum, you can write code that controls digital value, runs exactly as programmed, and is accessible anywhere in the world. So that sounds pretty cool, although, of course, they won't say anything bad about themselves. But uh, so why should you care about Ethereum? What was the big deal about Ethereum? Well, the easiest indicator is to check the size of the project, which is usually measured in the market cap. So there's this site called CoinMarketCap that collects all the cryptocurrencies and blockchain projects. And you can see that Ethereum is the second largest one, just second to Bitcoin itself. So that means that it is a huge project and uh, hugely inf influential. Also, after Bitcoin introduced the concept of blockchain, uh, six, six years after that, when Ethereum was introduced, uh, it also introduced a lot of new concepts that are in wide use today, like smart contracts on the blockchain. So Ethereum is really a, an important system. What they also say about themselves, let's uh, look, look at it. Uh, so it's the foundation for a new era of the internet. And that internet would look like this. It's, it's an internet where value and payments are built in. So as opposed to today's internet, well, China is doing okay because WeChat and Alipay are doing all this integration, but on the West, you know, payment integration is still far from optimal. It's an internet where users can own their data and your apps won't spy and steal from you. So we'll see an example for this that you can actually really own your data. It's an internet where everyone has access to an open financial system. And it's an internet built on neutral open access infrastructure 
controlled by no company or person. So there's no single entity that controls it. And also it's programmable. So developers can build these new kinds of applications that we would call decentralized applications. So let's look at the history of Ethereum. The last time we saw that Bitcoin was first introduced in 2008 with the publication of the Bitcoin white paper and the network started in 2009. In the next few years, Bitcoin steadily gained some popularity. So more and more people started using it for payments, you know, all kinds of people, all kinds of uh, projects. And at, at some point, people started to use it for more than just payments. They wanted to do more with it. I'd mentioned two different directions. So one is Bitcoin script, which is actually a part of a Bitcoin system. It's a feature in Bitcoin, and it can help people write some simple code to extend the capabilities of Bitcoin transactions. Another direction is to actually start a brand new blockchain, either copy Bitcoin and change some parts or write a new system. And uh, these are usually called, uh, called altcoins. The Bitcoin script, uh, is a, here's an explanation. A script is essentially a list of instructions recorded with each transaction that describe how the next person wanting to spend the Bitcoins being transferred can gain access to them. So previously we talked about how you need to provide a signature so that you can spend your Bitcoins. Turns out you can also do you know, much more than that. Uh, you can, so the, the signature part is this pay to pub key hash is the, the first example. But you can also have multi-signature, which means that more than one person has to sign it. So for instance, two parents in the family, they both have to agree to spend the Bitcoin in order to spend it. You can also have time lock, which means that it is, it is only spendable after a certain period of time. And you can have some other variations of this. But this scripting language is intentionally weak. We call it, uh, it's not Turing complete. So this is an intentional design choice in Bitcoin. I won't go into the details, I can explain to you if you're interested, uh, but there are a lot of different scenarios or applications that you cannot implement with this feature of Bitcoin. If you wanna learn how it works, then you can check out this website. It has some, I have the link here. I will send the slides to the group later. So it has some cool animations and explanations of what Bitcoin script is. So the other main direction was altcoins, which is uh, basically an altcoin is any cryptocurrency that is not Bitcoin. And according to Wikipedia, even before Ethereum, there were already more than 20 altcoins out there. So some are very different from Bitcoin. For instance, uh, I brought the example of Zcash and Monero. They offer a level of privacy that Bitcoin is unable to offer. So they have actually a lot of technical uh, innovation. Some other systems are actually uh, use case specific, so applications. For instance, Namecoin is for domain name, name registration. And there are other systems that are very similar to Bitcoin, just a small details, you know, difference. If you check this Wikipedia page, you can see a whole long list of different cryptocurrencies with their release dates. It's pretty interesting. So there's always some differences, but many systems are very, very similar to each other. Probably a good example is this, uh, I think it's pronounced Dogecoin. So it was introduced as a joke currency in 2013. Uh, so the author thought it's a joke, but people took it seriously. And then it's, uh, you know, reached a market cap of 60 million USD and it's still around. Uh, so this is an example of a new system that's not much different from Bitcoin, but it's still an independent blockchain. The problem with this, I would say is fragmentation. So on the one side, fragmentation of the ecosystem, because for each different system, you need to implement wallets, you need to implement nodes, developer tools, and these need to be developed, maintained, installed. Um, you know, you, you have to make your users install new stuff. You have to uh, roll these out. So that's a lot of uh, extra effort for a new system to be built. And probably more importantly, it's a fragmentation of mining power. So if you remember last time we talked about uh, how Bitcoin uses proof of work to, to reach consensus. And the thing about proof of work is that the more computers you have in your network or the more computational power you have, the more secure the system is. So if you break Bitcoin into two independent systems, then both of them will be half as strong as the original. Uh, so that is, a, that is an issue. 
for instance, there's this uh, website, Crypto51, which uh, estimates the cost of doing a double spend attack or 51% attack on different cryptocurrencies. I don't know about the estimates, but the, uh, their relation is probably correct. So for Bitcoin, you need like $300,000 for one hour attack. For Bitcoin SV, which is a fork of Bitcoin, it's much, much cheaper, 7,000 USD. So these systems are much easier to attack. And I, actually, I recall that BSV, I think there was a double spend attack this year or, or late last year. So it actually does happen. So to address these issues in 2013, this guy called Vitalik Buterin proposed Ethereum. He wrote this white paper called a next generation smart contract and decentralized application platform. And uh, I encourage you to, to take a look. It's not that technical. And uh, yeah, that was the start of Ethereum. So this guy, Vitalik Buterin, it's, it's very interesting because as you recall, Bitcoin was published under a pseudonym. So we don't really know who's the creator of Bitcoin. On the other hand, for Ethereum, we do know it's this guy and he's still very active. So uh, he has a lot of say in the future of the system because he's the one who came up with the idea. So he first grew interested in Bitcoin in 2011 when he was 17 very young. And he co-founded this uh, magazine called Bitcoin Magazine. So he's been very active throughout the years before, even before he proposed Ethereum. And then after the white paper, the next more noteworthy uh, thing is uh, the yellow paper, which was authored by Gavin Wood. He's a, he's a co-founder of Ethereum. And he actually came to Tsinghua. Uh, we hosted with Tiba Gavin Wood last September. It was a very interesting event. So he wrote this paper, which actually described how Ethereum works in detail, all the technical details. It's called Yellow Paper because the paper was yellow for some reason. Uh, this is a very technical paper that you can take a look if you're interested. And what they did, they founded this foundation and then they, they needed some money to develop the system. So in 2014, they started this crowd sale. So the idea was that you, can, you had, didn't have Ethereum yet, where you could pre-order Ethereum tokens and pay for them using Bitcoin. And this uh, Bitcoin that you paid was supposed to go to this Ethereum foundation, or it went to the Ethereum foundation, and they used it to develop the system and use it to this day. So according to this article, uh, half day after the sale began, 7.4 million Ethereum tokens had already been pre-sold. So it was a very successful fundraiser. And then they started Ethereum. Uh, probably a noteworthy detail or a, a hiccup in the system was the DAO, DAO attack, which happened in 2016 when a major application on top of Ethereum was hacked. So I'd like to emphasize Ethereum was not hacked, but an application was hacked. And uh, a lot of money was stolen from the users. And the, the community at the end decided to, to undo this transaction and give back the money to the users. But this was a very controversial choice and it split Ethereum into two independent chains. One is Ethereum and the other one is called Ethereum Classic. So we'll see how this attack went uh, in just a few minutes. As for the future, uh, you know, there's still a lot of issues with Ethereum, just like other systems throughput. So the speed of the system is uh, not uh, optimal. It's uh, very slow for real world applications. So they're working on Ethereum 2.0, which is a new system using sharding, and they want to move to proof of stake from proof of work. So this is exciting news. We've been waiting for this for years, so let's see how this goes. Now they say they will start rolling out this year. So Ethereum is a DAP decentralized application platform. So let's talk about what DAPs are. So when you talk about traditional applications, let's say a web page or your uh, phone applications, I would say they are often data silos. So for, for instance, on Facebook, you have your photos, you have your posts, you give it to Facebook and then, you know, they keep it and there's no easy way to move to a competing service. Like I couldn't start Facebook 2.0 tomorrow and uh, allow you to simply import your data. Also, these services are usually black boxes, so you don't really know what Facebook is actually doing with your data. So they are doing a lot of good stuff and some bad stuff, uh, I assume. 
So basically the business model is that you give your data to the company and they provide some services in exchange. Uh, I don't want to say it's a bad business model. I think it's it's pretty good that we get all these awesome services for free, but they're not really free, of course, because you don't pay with money, but you pay with your personal information. It's a, it's a good model, but it's uh, prone to misuse. So accidental misuse would be a data leak. So they have a bug and then some hackers steal your data. And intentional misuse would be, you know, Facebook, for instance, selling your data to advertisers, even though you don't want that. As an alternative, we can build decentralized applications that run on top of the blockchain, at least part of them. And the keyword here is transparency. So these applications are transparent. The rules are clear. Everyone knows how they operate. So they say that dApps are reliable, predictable, meaning that once they are uploaded to Ethereum, they will always run as program. They can control digital assets in order to create new kinds of financial applications. And they can be decentralized, meaning that no single entity or person controls them. So these kinds of applications can do some cool stuff. They can create new kinds of money or digital assets on the blockchain. They are unstoppable, uncensorable. Uh, so by this, we mean that, you know, in China, for instance, when they uh, stop you from accessing Google, they can do that because they know the IP addresses of the Google servers and it's it's easy to, you know, stop traffic between you and Google. But if you have a global distributed network like Ethereum, you know, computers all around the world changing dynamically, it's very hard to stop the whole network and it's very hard to stop you from accessing the network. So it's very hard to censor these kind of applications. And also uh, you can build all kinds of stuff like decentralized organizations, virtual worlds, uh, all kinds of applications that are governed collectively. So here's a short pro con uh, comparison. So decentralized applications have verifiable correctness. Everyone knows the rules, everyone can check the rules. Uh, it's, it also means transparency. They can have democratic governance. So there's a rule like how users can control the system and these rules are strictly enforced by the system. They are resistant to censorship. They have transfer of value built in and you have true ownership that we will see an example of uh, in a bit. There's also some, some drawbacks. So because it runs on a dis distributed network of, of nodes, of computers, the price can be higher. At least today uh, for Ethereum transactions, you need to pay a certain amount of money. There's also uh, scalability issues that I mentioned, performance issues. A lot of researchers, a lot of projects are working on this, but it's still more or less an open question. And also because blockchain is public and transparent, uh, maintaining user privacy is not impossible, but it's challenging. So you have to keep this in mind when you develop a dApp. And now let's, let us look at a few examples of decentralized applications, existing decentralized applications on Ethereum. Probably the most famous ones are ICOs and STOs. So the idea behind ICOs is that you can raise capital using digital tokens, you know, just like in the old world, in, in the traditional financial systems, companies can do an IPO uh, so they can sell their shares and then they can uh, raise capital through that. Uh, instead of shares, you can also sell digital tokens and it's called an initial, initial coin offering. And the idea is good, but ICOs are very unregulated. So there's no government or, or uh, authority that checks these projects. And, you know, 2017 was the year of the ICOs. Uh, lots of ICOs going on, lots of people invested a lot of money. And it turns out most of these projects were scams. You know, they just take your money and run away. So that's probably not a safe investment uh, option. A more recent alternative is, is called STO, which stands for Security Token Offering. It's uh, basically the same as an ICO. You uh, raise funds through this digital token offering, but it's more regulated. So you want to be compliant with all the regulations in the country that you're doing the STO. And actually, uh, I think in China, it's probably not legal, but in EU and, and uh, USA, you can do legal STOs. It might be some paperwork, but you can do it legally. And then, you know, this all comes down to a discussion of utility tokens versus security tokens. I won't go into details here, but I encourage you to check this link that I have here. They have a video that has a very clear explanation of this. 
Another cool example of a decentralized application is the DAO DAO, uh, which is it stands for decentralized autonomous organization. And the idea is that you you lay down the rules for an organization in code, and then you deploy this on the blockchain, and then these rules are automatically enforced. So rules are expressed in a thing called smart contract, and then shareholders in the organization can uh, submit proposals and vote on proposals, and that is how the organization works. So it's a very transparent, very democratic way of operation. Uh, all kinds of things could be run like this. Uh, traditional organizations. There are some open source projects run by this, run by this, uh, you know, run like this. And uh, you know, in theory, Tiba. Uh, once we have enough members, we could uh, operate like this. So you would have a Tiba DAO smart contract, and then uh, let's say all the core, core members would have twenty votes, or the uh, community members would have five votes and then everyone could submit proposal what we should do so it's it's pretty cool a more cute example is a uh, crypto kitties so this kind of application is called nft non-fungible token or collectible the idea is that uh, with blockchain you can have real unique ownership of digital data and what i mean by that is that uh, when you have some piece of digital data Let's say you have a PDF document on your computer. It's very hard, hard to ensure uniqueness. So you basically cannot ensure because you can copy it unlimited number of times. Maybe your friend has a copy of the document, so there's no real ownership. By using the blockchain, using Ethereum, you can actually keep track of ownership in a secure way. So even though I have the document uh, and you have a copy of the document, I can prove that I am the, the actual real owner of the document in the smart contract. So an example of this idea is a, a game called Crypto Kitties, where you have these unique uh, avatars like cats. They have different colors, different moods. Uh, you can breed them, you can sell them, you can buy them. And uh, yeah, so once you have this kitty, no one can take it away from you and you can uh, you know, easily prove that it belongs to you using Ethereum. So you can see some examples, uh, different kinds of cats are being sold for different prices. And then of course you have some specialty items. So this is basically a bit like baseball cards, I guess. So you have these special crypto kitties that are I'm sure extremely expensive. Uh, there's very few, few of them. And then people actually probably make some good money on this, you know, collecting these and selling these. Uh, final. I think very cool example is Decentraland, which is a company that we also we also hosted them two years ago at Tsinghua. So decentralized Decentraland is a decentralized virtual reality world. So it's a 3D world that you can join with your computer or your VR glasses or headset if you have one. And the the cool thing about this is that uh, you can actually buy land in this world. So you can buy a piece of land. And then you can do on that land whatever you want. You can create some visual uh, experience. You can create some services. And then other users can visit your land and use your services. And maybe you can even earn some money. So it's described here. Uh, it's a finite traversable 3D virtual space. And it's called a land token. Uh, it's a digital asset maintained in an Ethereum smart contract. And then people can buy parcels of this land. Uh, these parcels are permanently owned by the members of the community and they are purchased using this other token of Decentraland. So this is, I think, a very, very smart application. And this is an example of how you can actually own digital data uh, through Ethereum. So now that we've seen some examples for dApps, let's see how they work. We won't go into too much technical details, just the you know main ideas. Uh, so the main building block for dApps is uh, called smart contracts. And actually, this concept predates blockchain. It was introduced in the 90s by this guy called Nick Sabo. He defined them as a set of promises specified in a digital form, including protocols within which the parties perform the other promises. So the point here being that uh, you describe how the system should work in code. And you also use code to ensure that the system uh, works in that way and you know cannot be cheated. 
in the context of Ethereum, uh, this is kind of a misnomer. Many people say because smart contracts are neither smart nor legal contracts. So they're not really contracts, uh, but this is the name that they chose. So again, this word contract brings to mind legal agreements, but uh, in fact, smart contracts are just pieces of code that run on the blockchain and they are guaranteed to produce the same result for everyone who runs them. So it's very easy to verify uh, that the execution is correct. Last time we talked about Bitcoin, we talked about what blocks are and what blockchain is. So blocks are basically just collections of transactions. And these blocks in Bitcoin and also in Ethereum, they are chained together using their hash. And in Bitcoin, transactions are simple payment uh, uh, statements, let's say, sent to Bitcoin from Bob to Alice. Or you can have slightly more complex ones like uh, transaction three here says, send four Bitcoins from Bob uh, to Bob if both Alice and Claire agree. So this is a multi-signature kind of scenario. On Ethereum, transactions have a much wider variety. So we can have simple payments, just like first transaction here is sent to Ethereum tokens from Bob to Alice. But we can have a uh, whole kinds of other uh, transactions. So for instance, send a specific crypto kitty from one user to another user. Or you can also, just like name coin, you can use domain name registration. Uh, it really depends on the smart contract. When you write a smart contract, you define what kind of transactions you can accept. And uh, it's a Turing complete system. So you can basically, you know, the number of possibilities is infinite. You might ask how, how does this work in practice? How, how do you use a DAP? And usually a DAP can have a, a simple front end, just like normal web pages or phone applications. And uh, the difference is that the front end, instead of communicating with the back end, it creates a transaction and asks your wallet to sign it. So your wallet has all your private keys, it has all your identities, and uh, it can sign your transactions if you approve them. And then this transaction is sent into the Ethereum network and the DAP is updated accordingly. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that only you have your private keys. There's no you know, password stored in the server of the developer. Only you have the private keys. So no one else can make the changes on, on your behalf. And only you can sign a transaction. Uh, so that really gives you the authority to control your activities in this decentralized application. So here I have an example of this. So there's this system called MetaMask that I mentioned here. It's basically a browser plugin uh, that you can install on Firefox, Chrome, etc. And then it has your account. And what happens is that uh, if you have a website, there's a very simple website here. And when I click a button, this website will trigger a transaction. And this transaction will uh, have this pop-up window from my wallet. And then I see all the information about the transaction and I can I can confirm or reject. Basically, I can decide if I want to sign it or not. So that is basically how it works from the user perspective. And let's briefly discuss uh, Ethereum governance. So by that, I mean who really controls Ethereum. And to some extent, it's a philosophical question, decentralization. So to some extent, Ethereum is more decentralized uh, than Bitcoin. Uh, from other aspects, it's less decentralized. For instance, the creator of Ethereum, Vitalik, uh, he definitely has a lot of say in how, Bit how Ethereum is developed. So he doesn't have explicit power, but people believe in him. So what he says is probably, you know, many people might follow. But from the technical perspective, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum both uh, are governed or updated using two kinds of mechanisms. One is called soft fork and one is called hard fork. So soft fork would be a very simple protocol update or a very simple, you know, minor update. Let's say you fix a simple bug or you add the new API. It doesn't really change how the system works. Hard forks are, on the other hand, are major protocol changes. So for instance, if you want to change the block size limit, or if you want to change the, uh, is the number of issued tokens per block, then that is a hard fork and the people need to reach consensus on it. Let's just uh, look at this example. So in this example, this is the tip of the blockchain, these two blocks. And then the community decides to do an update in a future block, uh, block number four. 
And then once we reach that block, uh, some of the nodes will update the new version, some of the nodes will not update to the new version. The point is, uh, with small updates, these two versions are compatible. So two kinds of nodes can work, can mine on the same uh, chain. The difference is with hard, hard forks, the two versions are not compatible. So actually this will split the blockchain into two, just like this. So on the old version, nodes using version 1.2, 1.1, uh, they will stay on that chain, and the updated version will use, uh, you, you know, it will be a subchain, or an alternative chain. So these are competing forks. Uh, one has one portion of the miners, the other has the rest. In most cases, like when Ethereum is updated, uh, the updated fork will survive, and you know the other fork might be abandoned by all the miners. So that is the normal scenario. But in some cases, both of these forks might live. Uh, for instance, if the miners don't agree, some miners support the update, others don't support, then this might create two cryptocurrencies for one. And that brings us back to this uh, the DAO attack that I mentioned. So I mentioned DAO is a kind of application on top of Ethereum, and DDAO is a specific kind of DAO. They just called it DDAO uh, in 2016, I think. Uh, so this project had this crowdfunding phase, and it was, well, based on this article, it was the uh, largest crowdfunding in history, raising 150 million USD from 11,000 people. So that's pretty impressive. There was a lot of hype about this project. Uh, the problem is that their smart contract had a bug that no one uh, noticed. It's a, it's not a simple bug actually, uh, and it's very easy to make. And someone actually exploited this bug to hack the system. So a hacker managed to drain more than uh, 3.6 million Ether into, into another smart contract. And so this attack was so large that the price of Ether actually dropped from 20 to $13. So that's a huge effect on the whole system. So again, this was not a bug in Ethereum. This was a bug in the smart contract developed by other people. So in this case, uh, the community collectively decided to undo this hack. So how you could imagine is that there's a transaction that performs the hack, and then you could create a hard fork, which is all the same transactions, uh, but you make this one specific hack invalid. So that would create a new version of the, of, the, of the blockchain. Of course, you can probably see that this is very controversial because we usually say that blockchain is immutable. You cannot change it. You cannot change the history. Well, it turns out it's not true. It turns out if everyone agrees or the majority agrees, then you can change the history. And that's what happened here because I think 15% of all Ether was in that contract. So that was a huge blow to the ecosystem. So many people were supporting this, uh, this fork, but some people were not. And it actually split into two. So both of these forks are still existing. Uh, the new fork is called Ethereum. And the old fork was renamed Ethereum Classic. So they are the people who say that, no, you have to stay true to the vision of blockchain, blockchain and you cannot uh, change the history. And that basically concludes my presentation. So today we had a brief inf introduction to what e Ethereum is. We talked about the history, uh, how it was introduced by Vitalik Buterin. And we jumped into the topic of decentralized applications. We saw some cool examples. And uh, we also saw how these are implemented using smart contracts. And we described some, some issues of blockchain governance and this kind of hard forks. So if you have any questions, I encourage you to send it to the chat here or in on WeChat. We are happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, we will probably up, upload this video to YouTube and share the slides so you can check that as well. And yeah, thanks for listening and see you next time.